Sounds good to me. Hi, everybody. Uh, if you want to adjust your volume, this is about the volume that I'm going to be talking at today. Thank you for giving me your lunch break on this beautiful Tuesday. And we're just going to talk about LEAD today and give you a bit of an introduction. I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. If you haven't, this will be a great way to, to introduce you to something that's really predominant in our built environment and takes into account a lot of diff different disciplines. Um, so first off, what is it and why does it exist? All LEAD stands for Leadership and Energy and Environmental Design. And simply put, LEAD is a standard for us to rate what makes a green building actually green. So the society and public were tired of seeing people build a building, paint it green, and claim that it's good for the environment. And we kind of needed a third party to verify that it's actually a sustainable building to stop what's called greenwashing. And that's all LEED is. It's a standard for the public to trust that they know what we're buying when we have our own place or rent an office space. And like a restaurant's cleanliness, the standard that's, that shows it, or your steel-toed boots to protect your feet, standards are just in place to trust that we know what we're getting. In this case, we wanna be sure it's a sustainable building. Uh, but I haven't even introduced myself yet. My name is Lauren Melodic. Thank you, Rebecca, for hosting me today for, for Engineers of Tomorrow. I think it's a great initiative. Uh, and I'm happy that you guys could en join me. Uh, firstly, I am a civil engineering graduate about 10 years ago from the University of Toronto. If you, if you guys want to type in chat, just let me know what uh, discipline you're in or even what city you're from. I always like to see where the audience is. And how I got into LEAD and, and what I do briefly. Uh, after my first year, I worked at this company called Morris and Hirschfield, and they were building our service centers, the en routes along our, our highways in Ontario. And they were all going for LEED Silver, which I had no idea what that meant. But I saw it was a way to actually certify a building as sustainable. And I thought that was interesting and really missing in the market. And back then, I saw that you could get accredited by taking a couple exams, which I thought was a great way to get ahead in something I finally found interesting. Um, but you actually needed real life lead experience on these projects to sit the exams back 10 years ago. So I was just lucky to be in the right place. And I had a very luxurious task on the project. Uh, I single handedly designed all of their RV way stations, which, if you know what that is, it's a hole in the ground if you have an RV to dump its waste out. Gross. But uh, it's my claim to fame. I guess it's kind of sustainable if you think about it. Don't think about it though. Uh, and after. I took the exams, I passed them, went back to school my second year, and no one knew what LEED was, was back then, not in my professors, so no bragging rights for me, unfortunately. But, you know, I told my friends about it, and they said, look, this is where we're going in the field, how can I get involved too? Unfortunately, though, a lot of the workshops out there often were, you know, a thousand bucks plus, and no students or young professionals I know had the time or money for that. And so I just started tutoring some friends, and eventually there's enough demand to host workshops to train people to get LEAD accredited themselves and take this exam. And for the last 10 years, I usually hit the road and I traveled to about 100 cities each year across North America uh, to host a similar LEAD workshop to introduce it and prepare people for their LEAD designation. Uh, so far, 10,000 people have taken this thing with me and everybody who's followed my steps has passed, which is great. And I also work as a LEAD consultant. So what that means is I'm helping developers and owners actually certify their buildings. But that is enough about me. See, we got Queens, Dell, Gatineau, awesome. Oshawa, great, very great. Now, I wanted to just show us some examples of past historical ways that we used to build with natural systems and passive ventilation, which we often forget about. And usually when I'm in class, we have a bit of a discussion, but I'm just gonna point some things out. So this is Pantheon, pretty famous building, and it's one of the more sustainable ones is very well insulated. The oculus up here is the only source of natural daylight and it fills the room. And any rain that falls through it is caught and reused in the floor. And here, this is just in America. And what Native, Native Americans did was use these overhangs to provide passive solar to heat in the winter and stay cool in the summer, which I'll show you. A wigwam is an amazing example of really how to build with the environment. It's really the most sustainable buildings, the ones that 
are working with nature and actually using the principles that it gives us. And this is how we could apply them today in our modern society with all of our mechanical HVAC. Well, we could include a lot of passive ventilation, try to duct air that's cold through the north side, out through the hot side. Here we have those same overhangs to block the unwanted heat from the high summer sun, but free solar heat gain from the low angle winter sun. And it's not like these items are gonna break. There's no moving parts, there's hardly any energy at that all used, and we should really try to use these passive uh, ideas and naturally occurring items in our buildings today. And just to introduce the problem, which we, we know today, our current level of carbon dioxide on our planet has never been higher, and with that comes a lot of climate change. And we are familiar with the greenhouse gas effect. All this carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases, we know they trap extra heat in our atmosphere and warming our planet, having adverse effects on it. We see that not only our air is warming, but water is warming too, which is a breathing ground for two hurricanes. There's two hurricanes on the path right now for North America. That hasn't happened in a long time. And so that's one effect that people don't even think about and the money spent on repairs. Drought. A lot of land across the world is at risk because of our climate change. And we have a plentiful loaded amount of health impacts that we will talk about. But the, the real thing that I say is even the climate change deniers out there who don't believe that what we're doing is having an adverse effect artificially on the planet. Well, for those people, I say, you know what? You break down the earth. And it's just a finite amount of resources, no matter what kind of commodity we're looking at it. And the Earth has been generous enough to share those resources with us. They're unevenly dispersed throughout the world. In Canada, we are lucky to have a lot of natural resources. But it just doesn't make sense to wait to make a change. It's not economical because as we see our supplies diminish and our demands rise for our different fuels, well, those prices get higher. It's inefficient and it's just short-sighted because simply put, our consumption rate is too high. Like we're gonna run out of these items. So we might as well start being more efficient today. Now, our answer to this problem is something called sustainability. It's the buzzword of the 21st century. It seems everyone tries to be sustainable. Uh, and a nice quote that I like to say is, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we rather borrow it from our children. And that, and that gets you thinking that what we do now really impacts the future. And onto buildings, and we're gonna talk about sustainable construction and buildings. You might be surprised that our buildings, especially the north, 50% of our load over the year is for heating. It's a big one. And then the other majors are cooling, lighting, plug loads, which are on the rise. And I also like to get your mind going and say, you know, why do you think the building in Charlottetown from 1864 is actually more energy efficient than a newer building? And the reason is all that lovely glass. Today we're in a glass obsessed society. Everybody loves floor to ceiling glass, corner to corner glass, even just for the views, people say, but well, I don't know why my feet need to have a view of our pretty skylines all day. The real reason we're building with all this glass is it's cheap. Owners love it because it's light, it's cheap, but even the triple glazed glass doesn't come close to a basic walls insulating R value, how good of it is as an insulator. So you need to really balance the amount of windows, what facades the windows are on, as well as what types of windows. So you're getting a good window to wall ratio, which allows some daylight in, but still maintains the integrity of the built environment, which is a, the basis of building science and a big principle in LEED as well. And also someone, this is a much tougher one. They look very similar. Uh, we have a building on the left, which is our, or well, on, on your right, which is our, uh, residential building. And the only thing that separates these two is, yeah, they're glass boxes, but one has, has balconies and the other is a commercial office space without any balconies. And so this often stumps people, why, why would balconies make it more, make it less sustainable? Aren't you shading it a bit? And you're right, that does have a little passive solar effect. However, a lot of our condos are built without having a thermal break in our 
floor slabs. So it's a continuous concrete slab and that just acts as a big thermal bridge and sucks a lot of our heated or cooled air inside out through our balconies. So that's an interesting thing to think about when you're looking at these buildings. And the solution that we're gonna talk about today is LEED, which I mentioned. And the reason why it's been really successful is it's legitimate. What I mean by that is we created it, you know, actual professionals who are in the field. So generally speaking, it's not asking us the craziest amount to do, but it's much better than our building codes. And when you make the commitment to go green, that happens right away early on in the project, which is good. Because frankly, a lot of people forget about how their decisions are gonna affect the overall sustainability of the building. And most importantly, it's marketable. They have spent a lot of money publicizing LEED because frankly, if we didn't know what it meant, who would even care about it? But we know what it means and we're demanding it from our buildings. It's a point-based system. And if you haven't seen one of these plaques before, you'll probably notice them now. There are four levels of certification starting off with certified silver, gold, and the highest is platinum at 80 points. And there's 110 total points, which as a developer designer, you pick and choose to get for your building. And I'm gonna show you a number of them as a brief little overview momentarily. And where the points lie, there's a bunch of categories. In each category, there's mandatory things called prerequisites, so you have to do those. Credits are optional and you pick and choose where to get the points. And depending on how many credits, points gets you level of an award. The reason why there are mandatory minimums in each category is because LEED is not just a water rating system, an energy efficiency system. LEED is a whole building rating system. And that's why we have minimum efficiencies of 20% in water, of 5% in energy, to make sure at least we hit a, mo a minimum level of sustainability in each facet of the building. These are the categories, and I'm gonna go through them briefly in a moment. And the reason why you probably heard of LEED or seen those LEED plaques and why it's so dominant in the industry is it's done a great job at showing developers and owners that going green doesn't always mean cash money green. And there's a lot of cases that I've seen a lead building cost no more than a neighboring conventional built building. However, usually it's about a one to three to 4% initial cost premium, which doesn't seem like that much, but on these $100 million buildings, one to three million bucks is still something to most people. So why bother if lead buildings generally do cost more off the bat? Well, there's a high return on investment, which really is attractive to developers and owners in two ways. The indirect way, marketability. A lot of universities only build lead. Banks, TD, BMO, they only rent and buy lead buildings now. It strengthens what's called our corporate social responsibility program and our ESG rating, which is really important to attract new customers. Because today, it's always on our mind. And if our values align, maybe we'll come to university here, maybe we'll do business together. But the real tangible evidence is the building saving over time. And this chart kind of simplifies it. You know, a red building, sure, initially costs the least at the start, but it's just built to the code, the minimum we have to do. But over time, we're using more energy, more maintenance, more water. We're less vulnerable, we're gonna be less vulnerable if we build green. Sure, it costs a little more off the bat, but we see our ongoing costs are much less, simply because you're less vulnerable to fluctuations of energy, of water prices, because you're using less. And lead buildings often sell or rent for a two and up to 20% premiums than the conventional neighbor. Tenants are willing to pay more money to be in a healthier building for their tenants. That's gonna save them energy and water over time. And that's how the economics work. Now, if you haven't seen this pretty picture before, it's called the triple bottom line or the three Ps, the people, planet, profit. And it's kind of the basis of sustainability and lead and what we're gonna talk about. So we divide our earth into these, these three large spheres. There's the planet, environment, people, society, profit, economy. And what I'm hoping my building's able to do is satisfy a lot of their wants and needs to get that sustainable building in the middle. And so the profit side is what we just touched on with our high return on investment for these green buildings. But what about us? What about the people? We are living in these buildings all day, every day, and we are seeing more and more demand for green buildings. And frankly, if companies 
don't supply and meet the market's demand, those companies aren't going to be doing too hot in the future. And we're really seeing that shift to a generational level. Like grade school curriculums all have a component of sustainability now. Earth Day, Earth Hour, who even knew about those 40 years ago? Now they're totally embedded in our culture. Look, lead buildings promote a, a higher comfort level, higher health, more breathability, and that translate into a higher productivity from the workforce and a better quality of work. Because after all, the people inside the building were the most valuable part of it. When you break it down, you know, energy costs two bucks per square foot, rent costs two bucks, 20 bucks per square foot per year. But the people, if you added up all the salaries and benefits, divide that by the floor area of an office, we are paid over $300 per square foot per year. So that's like 10 times rent, 100 times more than energy. And so the people make a huge part of LEED. And it's a brand new job market. You know, we've had the blue collar workers, the white collar industry, and unfortunately now the one color I'm not wearing today, but we have of the green collar industry here to stay and it's good to get involved in today and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how to do that at the end of the presentation after all though it is our future so we should probably not uh, mess things up and there are some cute babies over there and after all this starts with education we have to learn why we're doing this and really present the problem and then the solution that is going to help us so that's the people side. And look, the planet, we'll get into detail, but I touched on that early on. Frankly, there's only one Earth. We should do not our best not to destroy it, hopefully preserve it for a few more generations, even more, ideally. And we're going to do that by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, lowering our contribution to climate change. And I'll show you how LEED touches on those items, too. Now, depending on where you are, sometimes there's actual incentives to build a green building. So some I've seen successfully implemented are structural ones. Maybe you build a green building in your town and the city says, you know what, you're building a green building, I'll let you build an extra two stories. What? Why? You're, I'm not even zoned to allow to do that. Well, cities say your green building is going to use less energy, less water, less, less load on all my infrastructure. I want that. So and it's incentivizing you to build two extra floors. And maybe you can sell those two floors and get your money right back from the premium you paid to make it green in the first place. More common ones are financial-based incentives. So in Toronto, for example, we have the Toronto Green Standard. And that's a really unique one here. You have to meet level one, tier one. That's a mandatory level. And if you meet tier two, an optional level, you get like 20% of your permitting fees back, which was 600 grand on a project that I worked on last year. So it can be good money and depending on where you are, if they are available. They're very localized and, and regionally based. Non-financial ones, maybe you build a green building in Toronto, we'll put you on the city of Toronto's website as the greenest building in town to show off. But you should know that LEED is not alone out there. Uh, there's a lot of green building rating systems across the world now. There's BREAM in the UK, ENEV in Germany, BBC in France, Green Star in South Africa and Australia. There's another one with that logo called the Living Building Challenge, which is really cool. It is way harder than LEED. It's net zero energy, net zero water, treating your own wastewater on site. It's real, full sustainability. The reason why LEED is the most popular by far globally is because it is global. It's globally consistent. It's the same in every country. And a lot of multinational companies like to keep their building programs consistent to a high level. And it's realistic, as I said. It's not asking us the craziest amount, but it does significantly improve based on our code. So it's much better than our codes. Now with LEED, there's really two sides to it. The one you've probably seen out in the world is buildings. Buildings get certified. We saw the plaque I showed you, and there's four levels of it. People, though, we get accredited. And there's two levels of accreditation. The green associate is the first level. And that's the biggest one that I teach to a lot of young professionals and students. You know, there's no prerequisites for it. It's two hours long, 100 multiple choice questions. Uh, and it costs $100 for full-time students or recent grads. And a lot of people just want to get it as a nice resume booster, which don't get me wrong, it is a good one, but it's a lot more than that. I'm looking at a lot of developers asking for their buildings to be LEED certified because 30% of new buildings in North American cities are going for LEED. And if I'm a company bidding on those projects and I can say, look, 
90% of my staff are lead accredited. We know what we're doing. It's a lot easier for them to get those projects. And this makes it a lot easier for you to get those coveted positions. And all kinds of engineers. As you can see uh, in our group, we have mechanical, chemical, electric, uh, nuclear, awesome. They're industrial, everybody's from a different background. I, I'm civil, so we really got a, a wide range, wide range. So the green associate is a level one, and it's a mandatory prerequisite to level two, the accredited professional. Uh, that's the one you eventually need to get, and there's different specialties, which I'll touch on. But for example, I'm a BDNC for new buildings and an O&M for existing retrofits. But the green associates gotta be passed first. Who created LEED? The creators of LEED are the US Green Building Council. They produced the rating system, which is how we rate a green building. They also produced the reference guides, which are 800 wonderful pages telling you exactly one step at a time how to build a LEED building. And then there's this tool called LEED Online, which we submit our proof that we built it properly, all of our evidence, drawings, documents, uh, pictures even, and the Green Business Certification Inc. reviews it all and makes sure we did it properly. They also create our exams and decide what to test us on. So the USGBC, I think of it as like the creators of LEED and the GBCI more enforcing it out there and making sure we do it properly. Uh, in Canada, we also have the Canadian Green Building Council, and they run some cool conferences and do some public advocacy. But the USGBC, as we said, it's an international standard, so leads the same everywhere. Our exams are in Canada and globally are, are based on uh, the US version, and, and so we use that as well. Uh, but every country nowadays has their own Green Building Council, which is great. One thing's for sure on our planet, everybody, our population is rising pretty quickly. And there's only one thing going up faster than that, which is our demand for energy. And the only way I see us keeping up is one of two. We're either gonna create more sources of energy or just use less of it overall. But think about it like this. For every one kilowatt hour of energy we need, it is three to 100 times more expensive to generate it. Whether it's nuclear, coal, renewable, it doesn't matter how. Rather than saying instead, wait, where do we already use that one kilowatt hour of energy? Let's reduce our consumption. I'm telling you, sometimes it's 100 times cheaper to look where you can reduce consumption than it is to produce new capacity. And if financially that makes the most sense, reducing consumption, what makes even more sense is going for the biggest consumer, our beautiful buildings up to 50% of our energy, 72% of our electricity, and 38% of our carbon dioxide are due to buildings. Crazy. So if financially it makes sense to maximize the reduction of our consumption first, let's start there. And that's a huge part of LEED, is reducing our building's impact on the planet. And one thing I love LEED for recognizing is there's a plenty amount of good tools out there we just aren't great at actually using them in our industries. And the life cycle approach or assessment is, is a huge, great example, which is good tool to compare the actual environmental attributes of products or buildings by not just looking at one stage of it, but looking at how did you extract it, manufacture it, use it, transport it. And we're gonna see how LEED incorporates a lot of good tools and makes us use them sometimes without even knowing they're being incorporated into the actual rating system. So I like that. These are the seven different impact categories where LEED has decided which credits should be worth how many points. And I'll just read them quickly. We're trying to reverse our contribution to climate change, number one importance, enhance human health and well-being, protect our water, our biodiversity, our other resources, have a greener economy and enhance social equity and quality of life. And that's loosely how LEED has based their point on per credit. A quick uh, show on how the actual building is certified. The first step is registering the project. You play, pay a flat fee for that, the owner does. And then the project administrator is the person who registers the project. And so that's usually me. 
That's a lead consultant or a sustainability consulting firm. Just Google this in your area. You are going to find a ton of results. This is a booming industry. There's a lot of developers and owners that want to get their building leads certified, and they seek out, you need help from a lead consultant. So that's, that's what I do, and there's a lot of people out there that do that now, which is nice because it is in demand. And I'm like this middleman who is connecting all the design and construction team members through Lead Online with the GBCI, which will eventually review it. And I chase down everyone. I need your signature owner for credit one, engineers your calculation for two, architect your drawing for three. And it's just our submissions tool to prove that we built it properly. If you remember, this was one of the rating systems for Lead. So one thing I do like about Lead is they recognized over the years that different buildings have totally different needs from a sustainable standpoint. And so this rating system is like the umbrella called Building Design and Construction, or BD&C, and it's for all new buildings. And within BD&C, there's different types of new buildings. So those are market adaptations around us, but they're very, very similar. Just a few unique credits in each of them because uh, school has a few items that don't have anything to do with healthcare or hospitality. Whereas healthcare, one credit, for example, is designing for flexibility. If there's new diseases like we're having during the pandemic and being able to move items around in oversized spaces to in increase the size of the ICU, for example, that's a part of LEED. Um, so that's one thing I really like LEED recognizing is different buildings have different sustainable needs. And then we have operations and maintenance for existing building retrofits. There's interior design and construction. There's LEED for homes. And there's also LEED for neighborhood development for a, a large project like the West Donlands project in Toronto, the Hudson Yards project in New York City. These are large LEED gold neighborhoods. But the most common one is building design and construction. I talked about prerequisites, so I'm not going to go into too much more about that. It's the mandatory item in each category we need to meet. And then our credits is where we pick and choose. And having a good understanding of the intent of the credit is the most important thing for us in LEED. And it's really why we're doing the credit. Now, I'm just going to quickly run through through and we'll, we'll open up for questions uh, in about five, 10 minutes, but I'm just gonna quickly run through what some of the points look like. Like how do you get to that level of lead goal? What do you need to do? And the first one is a big principle in sustainability. It's called the integrated design process. The idea that if you're the mechanical engineer, I'm the, the insulation envelope engineer, I don't want us to work isolated and separate. People are inclined to just focus on what they're doing and getting paid for and that's it. No, I want collaboration and sustainability. If I make my wall super high insulated, high R value, and you make your HVAC too efficient or more efficient than we need it to be, you know, that's over designing the building. So collaboration from a very early point is called the integrated design process and it's crucial to a successful lead building. Location and transportation, and these boxes I, I use in my course, it's my name and convention, but you can see all of the different uh, credits and prerequisites and how many points to a minimum and maximum is available. And our first one is location and transportation. And what this look is looking at is not building on green fields that haven't been built on before. We're looking at trying to remediate brown fields we're looking at trying to build in a dense area to, to reduce urban sprawl and share amenities and infrastructure and less reliance on the car, which brings me to the transportation. Four credits discouraging people from driving alone in a gas guzzler, like encouraging people to ride public transit, ride your bike to the building, reduce parking and green vehicles with EV charging stations. And that's our first one dealing with where the building is, what's around the building, and how people get to it, which is a total of 16 points. And here is my uh, little legend on how to read these uh, boxes if you're interested. And I, I'm gonna share the slides with everybody after too. Um, in sustainable sites, we're looking at what we do to the site itself. So are we protecting it from erosion and sedimentation during construction? Do we understand the site that we're working with? Maximizing open space and encouraging people to get out there and use it 
reducing the heat island effect by using brighter or greener roofs, vegetated roofs, shading our hardscapes so all of our dark asphalts don't heat up. And also rainwater management, a huge one, trying to reduce the runoff and the load in our infrastructure and light pollution as well. Light pollution, maybe we wanna see the stars finally tonight or at least stop annoying the animals and pointing light where we need it is important. And that's our sustainable sites category. Water efficiency is pretty simple. Anywhere you see water being used in the building, you wanna reduce the amount of potable or drinkable water that you use. And, and you can do that by using things like dual flush toilets, low flow faucets, uh, a urinal that only uses water from the collected from the rain from the rooftop. Um, we're talking about cooling tower water usage, which is a huge source of water consumption, but also a great way to cool the air inside your building. And then we look at irrigation, the outdoor water use, trying to reduce potable water use and deliver water to the root instead of spraying it above the ground. And that's all about water inside and outside and metering it. And if we look at this chart, Canada, we are number one, we're the best. We use the most energy per person, oh boy, in the world. So we're the worst. But look at how far North American countries are ahead or behind everybody else. And the reason is, we're lucky. Relative costs of energy are low here. A, lo a lot of people have access to energy. And it gets really cold here, really hot here. Extreme loads, cheap energy with access equals this chart. We use lots of it. But how you should look at this and I look at this, what an opportunity to hop into it today. This is the worst we're ever going to be behind. So lucky us, we can get the ball rolling. And that's your Canadian optimism and how I think about it every day. Oh, here's a, this is actually in Oshawa. Uh, it's a PV panel I worked on years ago before I started traveling and now I look like this, thank you. Um, our next one's all about energy. And so just to name you a few things that are, are, are big items, commissioning and verification, that's trying to make sure all of our high performance systems are actually gonna work like we paid them to work. Uh, I'm minimum and optimized energy performance up to, 20 points here almost, all about modeling the building's energy consumption and working with energy modeling software to figure out how they can how you can reduce the amount of energy used. And that's the largest credit because you're gonna save the most money, reduce the most greenhouse gas emissions. We talk about refrigerants, which are in our heat pumps carrying heat inside and out, which have a long atmospheric life and are bad for our ozone, like Freon. We talk about renewables on-site and off-site, as well as earning points from that and selling it back to the grid. And that's what our energy focuses on. Our next one, materials and resources, focuses on where we get our materials, how they're made, who produced them, what chemicals went into them, and where they'll go at the end of their life. That's materials and resources. And our next big one in indoor environmental quality, I mentioned the people were the most valuable part of the building, so we want to make sure we're healthy. And so lead piggybacks off of a lot of ASHRAE standards, which tell us how much fresh air should we bring in per minute based on the size and the amount of people in the building. Here we also look at environmental tobacco smoke control, uh, smoking away from the building and not inside. We have an acoustical credit, which tries to minimize our sound carrying across different areas. Uh, we have an indoor construction credit to make sure our chemicals are, are managed during construction and new items aren't contaminated. Uh, we talk about thermal comfort, we talk about lighting quality and comfort, the amount of daylight coming into our building. Do we have a view from our, our seats? Uh, and that's all about the inside of the building. And our last two are more bonus I like to think of them as innovation and design. Four ways, number one, you can make up your own credit and prove that it's good for the environment, the economy, society, but out of the scope of the reference guide today. Uh, exemplary performance is a bonus point if you do more than we ask. If you test a test new credit, a pilot credit out, we'll give you a point. And little old me, a lead AP is worth a point on a lead project, um, which is always a nice reason to get the AP. 
And there's different priorities. Like a Toronto building has different priorities than an LA building. So each region, for example, LA, they voted, the USGBC chapter voted in LA that said our water credits are the most important. So each water credit gets an extra point tacked onto it. So we're more likely to pursue them because they're a little more valuable. Anyway, just a quick recap, everyone. I want us to learn from our past. Buildings are not new. We've been building them for thousands of years. But recently, we started focusing on our energy consuming devices. Let's use those passive and natural occurring features in our buildings today. And we could, we should, but we're not very good at it right now. Also, LEED is not the answer to all the world's problems, but it's a good start for a couple big ones. And every few years, a new version comes out. Uh, we're having version 4.1 come out soon, which is gonna raise the bar a little bit more. And eventually that bar will be high enough to be that answer to at least a couple big problems we face. Also, when I go through a lot of credits, when I'm teaching my classes, I see a lot of people scratching their head saying, why is this worth a point? That's the most logical way to design and build. And you are right. But historically, we love taking shortcuts in our design and construction industry, unfortunately. Uh, and in LEED, we try to encourage people to build it correctly the first time around. But everybody's got to work together to get that best building out of our investment. So that's pretty much it for today. Uh, I'm going to open the floor up to any questions and Rebecca, um, a little bit more about what I do. So as I said, normally I'm about to gear up to hit the road and, and I travel to about four to five cities a, a week and work with universities to, to bring my four to five hour workshop uh, to them. Obviously that's changed a little bit. Um, so for the uh, last six months now, I've been doing live webinars, which have gone pretty well. Um, as you can tell, this is a little different than probably some of your other Zoom, Zoom or go to meeting experiences. I hope it's a little more engaging having me on half the screen. And so pretty much how it works is I have a four hour, five, usually goes five hours webinar. It's this, but I expanded a lot. Uh, and a lot more interesting because I can dive into some, some neat aspects of sustainable building principles. And after that, you read my study guide, you do my four practice exams, and then you can take the official Lead Green Associate actual exam. Uh, my course costs $150 for students and the actual exam is $100, uh, charged by the US Green Building Council. And so far, everybody who's followed my steps has passed, which is great. And so if you are interested, you are more than feel free to register for one of the live webinars, or I also have it recorded as a self-paced version, which you can start at your own leisure and take the exam anytime. Um, the exam is now offered online from home, and it's offered seven days a week. So you just need a few days in advance to book it. And that is all for me, everybody. So if you have any questions, uh, by all means, uh, you can just raise your hand or uh, unmute your mic as we are happy to answer. Thank you so much, Lauren. I 